The, uh, the story I'm going to share with you this morning um, begins just about six years ago. In fact, on uh, March 22nd, 2014, at 10.37 a.m., to be exact, and that's the moment that a hillside in the community of Oso, Washington, collapsed on a Steelhead Haven, which was a neighborhood that was located just beyond the tow. Um, ironically, that event occurred on a clear, kind of rare, sunny um, Saturday morning. And, um, but that event was preceded by a late winter three-week rainstorm. And events like that are not common in the Pacific Northwest, but they're not unheard of either. So that wasn't really an extraordinary circumstance leading up to this event. That uh, landslide bears the very dark distinction of being the uh, deadliest landslide in North American history. It claimed the lives of 43 residents of the community of Steelhead Haven. And I had the opportunity to co-lead a gear investigation of that landslide, working in collaboration with Jeff Keaton and with a really phenomenal group of geotechnical engineers and geoscientists. And this is one of the first pieces of data that I looked at when we began that work. This is bare earth LIDAR that was acquired shortly after the landslide occurred. And I was deeply unsettled by looking at this LIDAR because even to the untrained eye, you can see that there are large volume, long run out landslides that permeate throughout this valley. And I began to ask myself, how did this community come to be? And how was it that people continued to move to the Steelhead Haven community and build new homes there, even in the years leading up to the Oso landslide? A couple months later, I was giving a talk on some of the gear work that we did, and I was giving it locally to a Geo Institute chapter in Seattle, and the host of the meeting told me that someone who had been affected by the landslide was in the audience and wanted to speak with me after the presentation. And I have spent a lot of my career investigating geologic disasters, but they've always been away from my home. I've never had an investigation in my own home community. And so I was used to flying in, to collecting data, to writing technical reports and leaving, and not really having a connection with people on the ground. So I stayed around afterwards, and I met someone whose story still haunts me today. It's an individual who had stepped away that morning to run an errand and came back to find emergency rescue vehicles blocking the road and their family gone. And I asked them how they were getting on at this point, and they said that they wanted to remain part of that Oso community. They did not want to leave that community but they wanted to get away from the landslide itself and so that they were going to move to the south side of that valley. And I paused because I knew the south side of the valley was equally dangerous to the north side of the valley and that that wasn't a good idea. And I shared those thoughts. And as I took the bus home that evening, I thought that this is really unfair, that someone in this situation and members of the public are not receiving our technical information. And in the months that followed that, there were a lot of questions that were posed in public forums, by media, and by decision makers about a lot of basic things from this landslide. And I felt that we, at a minimum, had some unique insights and also had some answers to those questions. And so I decided to embark on a campaign of trying to share our information with the public and with decision makers. And my first stop was US Congress. This is a visit that I facilitated as a briefing with our government relations office at the University of Washington. And I met with the staffs of the Washington contingent and shared some of the thoughts and also shared a path forward because I said that we as engineers have solutions to some of these geologic hazard problems. And I also began to write for the public in some public forums, first in the Seattle Times in 2014. I later collaborated with another GEAR team member and a, a colleague of mine from the University of Washington, Dave Montgomery. And we wrote an article that was published in the New York Times. And then uh, in 2016, I continued to write a two-year perspective on what we had learned and what questions remained about this landslide event. And one of the things I found that this was a way of gaining some influence with policymakers. In fact, I found that Representative Susan Del Bene, who represents the Oso District, uh, began to pick some of these pieces up and share them with her constituents. And in um, February of 2016, her office contacted me and told me that they, were, uh, they wanted to address this with a major policy action. 
and asked if I could provide input and feedback on a policy initiative that they were drafting at that time. It was called the Landslide Identification and Loss Reduction Act. And I had this opportunity to interact with them, and this was on short order because they wanted to introduce this on the two-year anniversary of the OSO landslide. My first concern with this was that the term landslide identification might draw some concern. I had given a, a talk at a, at a legal forum several months earlier where I had attorneys outright tell me that they would oppose any effort to identify landslide hazards because they were representing developers and property owners and that could adversely impact the, the value of those properties and those development opportunities. Um, so I expressed some concern with that. I also thought there was no uh, consideration of co-seismic landslides, so I had the opportunity to articulate that role. Um, talked about the funding appropriation that's needed to make progress in this area. I had a chance to describe NSF's contribution to fundamental science um, on, uh, on, on, uh, as it pertains to landslides. And then finally, I had the opportunity to secure some endorsements from our professional society, ASCE, and my other member society of the American Geophysical Union. And so that bill was introduced in 2016. It was renamed the National Landslide Loss Reduction Act, and its purpose was to uh, form a national program to identify and reduce landslide hazards. In the press release, you can see that ASCE is prominently featured here as a group providing an endorsement of that bill. That bill was introduced in the uh, 114th Congress in 2016, and there was no action taken. And I, quite frankly, was deflated by that because I felt that we had spent a lot of time working on this. But Representative Delbene's uh, legislative director, Ben Borowski, told me to be patient through this process. And so in 2017, the bill was reintroduced in the 115th Congress by Maria Cantwell. Uh, Susan Delbene, uh, Lisa Murkowski, Patty Murray, and Diane Feinstein. And let me pause for a moment to just recognize and thank this coalition of women in Congress who have taken the initi initiative of moving this bill forward. The bill made it through committee, but it did not come to the floor for a vote. And you should keep in mind that, of course, at this time, this is a Republican-controlled Congress. And so the bill was introduced yet again, now with a, uh, a slightly different title, but it's the really largely the same bill. It's now called the National Landslide Preparation Act, and it was introduced to the 116th Congress. Representative Delbene said it definitely helps to be in the majority party to make sure that bills get onto the floor and they get passed. And I'm happy to say that on June 4th of 2019, that's just what happened. It was passed on a unanimous vote in the U.S. House of Representatives, and that's extraordinary given our highly uh, polarized political climate today. The bill includes initiatives for 3DEP, which is the National LIDAR program. It establishes a National Landslide Hazards Reduction Program. It expands landslide early warning systems. It streamlines and improves coordination between federal agencies that deal with landslide hazards. And it also includes a funding appropriation for NSF and also for the USGS to conduct research, applied and practical research on landslide hazards. The next stop for this bill is the U.S. Senate. And if this is something you're interested in, I would suggest you to, that you read the text of the bill. It's available now as Senate Bill 529. And if this is something you get behind, contact your senators, because there's 100 people left who need to pass this bill in order to move this to, uh, to, to legislative enactment. If I've piqued your interest in public policy and the manner in which we can influence public policy, let me share with you a couple thoughts on how you might engage. And this is a graphic that was presented this year by the Sharing Science Program of the American Geophysical Union. And I think it shows a lot of paths forward of how you might get involved. Involved including interacting with policymakers, both in DC and in the home district, and at all levels, at the state level, at the local level, at the federal level connecting with members of the public, uh, outreach at the K-12 level, connecting with media either as a newsmaker or as a reliable source for, uh, for, for media reports and for the press. My own advice is to start small, but to start and to focus on communicating your ideas in a simple, easy to understand um, manner, but also one that maintains its technical integrity. Be prepared to be patient through this process. Connect directly with decision makers, particularly those in your own districts. 
and know the policy implications of your work and your research and be able to articulate those. What can we do as a broader geotechnical community? Well, we can start to really focus on strategic goal number one of the uh, Geo Institute, which is to collaborate externally to promote value and leadership of the geo, permission, of the geo profession in public policy. We can also leverage the national stature of ASCE. It's a highly respected national organization in Congress. And we can also leverage our standing with members of the public who see us as guardians of the public welfare. I'm gonna close with one more short story about OSO. And this is about an individual who bought their dream home. Uh, they were a young professional, was age 31. They sadly perished in this event, but they bought their dream home unaware of the landslide hazard that existed in Oso. They had bought their home just a couple of months before the landslide occurred. And it's easy to see why they weren't aware of that hazard. That's a photo of what Oso looked like before the landslide occurred, and it's an alluring landscape. But like all geologic hazards, the hazard is invisible to us at the ground level. It's subterranean but we have the tools to see and map those landslide hazards and to make members of the public aware of them. We can therefore reduce landslide risk. We also have the means to influence and shape public policy at all levels, local, state, and federal. And if we do that, we might find that in addition to all the exciting and great technical work that we do, one of our greatest professional legacies might become meaningful long-term policy actions. Thank you for your attention.